Uh, actually, if it can come here, it'll be good. These things are called ice cream cones because you need to be really close. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we call them. So, they use the ice cream cone. Here's my ice cream cone. So welcome once again. I want to talk today. We'll get to a story very soon. But stories exist, see, all teachings across all religions and all teachings, whether it's science, technology, doesn't matter. They have a understanding component where the brain comes in and we say, but the, the brain mainly decides what's right and what's wrong. It's called buddhi. Uh, it's a faculty of discrimination. Just as important is the feeling component. You have to feel good about what you're doing. You have to feel the presence of the teachings in your heart. That is called bhakti. Feeling is so the combination of buddhi and bhakti together results in something magical. And this is called jnana, wisdom. Otherwise, it simply becomes facts, information, or knowledge, never really leading to transformation. That's why stories are important. While scriptures engage your buddhi, stories engage your bhakti, and that the nexus of knowing and feeling is wisdom. So that's why across all cultures, it's not just here. Um, I was in Iceland a few years ago, uh, and in the airport, they had a list of best-selling books in Iceland. Number one on the best-seller list was a mythology. It was a very famous story that was in Iceland. Okay, and it, it's the same thing. One of the things they found in the ruins of the Sumerian or the Babylonian uh, civilization was an epic, epic that has been preserved for 4,000 years called the Epic of Gilgamesh. And in India, of course, you have stories from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the 18 Puranas, and all over the place. Even if you look at modern movies today, English movies, and, and especially from the Telugu film industry, good heavens, Raju Mauli, those, those movies are all about mythology. We are creating new mythology as we go on, whether it's the mythology from Bahubali or whether it's the mythology from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Stories always come because the mind, the, the heart feels good with stories. So uh, with that, let me introduce the theme for my talk today, which is success. Why are some people successful and other people not successful? And more importantly, what do we need to do to be successful? Well, first of all, it depends on what success is. For some people, it's about money. For some people, it's about having a family. For some people, later on in life, it is finding peace or just saying, oh, I hope my children and my grandchildren are okay, and on and on. And for, for some people, it is bigger things like world peace, protecting the environment, the animals. Each person's definition of success is different. The question is, according to your individual definition, how can you be successful? If you ask people, generally, you know, if I ask around, I go, okay, why do you think somebody is successful and somebody is, isn't? And you might get an answer which says, well, you need to work hard. Anybody disagree with that? But don't you know people who just have success without working hard? Be honest. What's going on there? So maybe you need to work hard, maybe you don't. Okay, what about you, somebody will say, you, you got to be networked. You need to know people. You need to know, be at the right place at the right time. And say you have to be smart, you have to have a high IQ. Now this is a losing proposition, right? It feels like you're either born to be successful or you're born to fail. So not, able to not able to hear? Let me, let, let me do this ice cream cone thing, if not. How, how about now? If not, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do this. This is perfectly fine. it take to be successful in turning on the sound system? <laughs> okay. Oh, this is good. This is good? Okay. So, is it a matter of... So this is why 
the most common answer, and you say, what does it take to be successful? You know what that is? The most common answer, you have to be lucky. Because we really don't know what's going on. Is it IQ? Is it knowing the right people? Is it hard work? Who knows? This is the common view, and perhaps we can all resonate to it based on our own life experiences. Some idiot who has no right to be successful suddenly is successful. Somebody who we know, is, or perhaps ourselves, all the right to be successful, and we are not. So you just say, it's a crapshoot. The roll of the dice doesn't matter. It's luck. But the yogic view says something else entirely. Here's what it says. It says that everyone can be successful. Not only that, it says something much stronger. It says, eventually, everyone has to be successful. There is no choice. Life keeps teaching you lessons until you learn from it and be successful. You, you've had that experience, the same thing repeats itself. When you're 20, when you're 30, you don't learn from it. When you're 50, it comes again. When you're 70, it comes again. So yoga says that Everyone can be successful, everyone has to be successful. There is no choice at all in this matter. Then it says that luck has nothing to do with it. When you put the proper amount of effort, you manufacture your own luck. The harder you work, the more lucky you get. So hard work is absolutely essential. What about people that are successful without hard work? Well, that's good karma from a past lifetime. That'll go away very quickly. How many, how many children of very rich people have we seen who squander their wealth? So I'll not dwell on it anymore. I'll just talk about us regular people. So you're still working on the success of this thing here. <laughs> so you have to work hard, but oh, I sound different. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Testing. Wow. Okay. So you have to work hard like these people did to get this working. But that's not enough. That's not enough. There is one more ingredient that's necessary in addition to working hard. And Every one of us has it. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter where you are in life. We all have this. In addition to hard work, we all have this ingredient. We've just forgotten that we have it. With, with these two things, hard work and ingredient X, I'm going to name it in a moment, we can all be successful. What, whatever success means for you. Okay, everybody with me? Anybody wants to guess what that ingredient X is? Go for it, there's no wrong answer. Hmm? Okay. Krishna says devotion, go. Hmm? Attitude, okay, good. What else? Concentration, okay. Hmm? God's blessing. Well, that's always required, so we'll keep that aside. And that's always there, that's not selectively given out. Okay, there was. Uh, a, a good, what kind of mind? Okay, then? Yoga. Commitment? <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, you have to be alive to do anything. So along with God's blessing, let's keep those two as obvious. <laughs> Intense desire, perseverance, determination. Great belief, yes. Passion. Confidence, one more. Let's go for one more. Discipline. Discipline. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, not to worry about the outcome. Not to worry about the outcome. Oh, everything of what you guys said is exactly right. Time management. Time management. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Um, but the closest to what I'm looking for, and I'll explain why, is what Srinivas Ji, what Srinivas Garu just said, which yeah. is not to worry about the outcome. Yourself, yeah, uh, that's true, yourself. But here is what the Bhagavad Gita says on this. This is chapter 2, shloka number 48. It says, Krishna is telling Arjuna, Yoga staha kuru karmani sangam tyaktva dhananjaya siddhyas siddhyoho samo bhutva samatvam yoga uchyate. See, 
definition of success right there. Yoga staha kuru karmani, meaning established in yoga. Whatever yoga means, we'll talk about that later. Yoga established in yoga, kuru karmani. Do whatever you're supposed to do, do your duties. Sangam tyaktva dhananjaya, without attachment to what's about to happen, being calm. Siddhihi asiddhihi samo bhutva, treat. Um, uh, siddhi, accomplishment, asiddhi, failure, evenly, then this is the key. This is the missing ingredient. Ingredient X, samatvam yoga vuchyate, samatvam, equanimity, calmness. Hard work combined with calmness. All the rest, just think about this for a moment. Somebody said discipline. Somebody said time management. You're very disciplined and then suddenly, Somebody makes you very angry. Okay, you, you're going around, this is day number five, you're getting up at four, doing your yoga, doing all of your work, you're well on the way to success. And then somebody makes you angry. Can you stay disciplined after that? Almost impossible. Say, oh, I was so angry, I had to just go for a run, I had to eat some chaat, whatever it is. We are already on the slippery slope. Without the ability to be calm, we cannot be successful. Yeah. The opposite of calmness is restlessness. If you're restless, can you concentrate? Somebody said concentration. You cannot. If you're not calm, can you apply your whole self? Will your passion have any meaning? Absolutely not. Because passion is a heart quality. Calmness is the ability to keep the heart still. How could you be passionate about anything if you're very restless in the mind? Everybody with me? That's why everybody has it but we've forgotten that we have it. Now, do you all, does this make sense or are you still a little suspicious? Maybe you're a little suspicious. Okay, so let me tell you the story of Arjuna. You all know who Arjuna is. Okay, it's from the Mahabharata. See, in India, there are so many hundreds of stories and in each of these stories, you have these great warriors who, who are depicted. Uh, and among all of these great warriors, there are three that have been absolutely undefeated and they are recognized as the greatest of all. The first one is Rama. Second one is Krishna, both undefeated. But they are both avatars, right? They are Vishnu in human form. How could they be defeated? They are the very definition of victory. The third one is Arjuna the only other indomitable warrior. You can look through all the scriptures. This is true. Rama, Krishna, Arjuna. Now Arjuna was a human being just like you and I. He became so successful as a warrior that he remained undefeated like Rama, like Krishna, like all the gods. He acquired this ability during his time with his guru. So let me let me go through that and tell you how he became the greatest warrior. So our story takes place a long, long time ago. This was in the final years of a higher age known as the Dwapara Yuga. It was the age of energy. We don't know how long ago it was. Maybe 2,700 years ago, maybe 5,100 years ago. We don't really know. But in that time, and it was the it was the Sandhi Kala. It was a period of transition. The Kali Yuga was just beginning. People were already becoming a little more materialistic, a little more cruel. They had forgotten that it's the hand of God that makes them do anything good. And it is their own ego that makes them do anything bad. And they had forgotten that before you possess, you have to donate. And they had forgotten all of these. There is a concept in the Bhagavad Gita called Yoga Kshema. Yoga, yoga is not yoga, hatha yoga. Yoga means fortune. Chema means protection. Fortune and protection, that's what we are here. Yoga kshemam vaham yaham, I will take care of your fortune and protection, Krishna says. They knew about fortune and protection, but they didn't know about dana, giving. So Kali Yuga was rapidly approaching, evil was on the ascendant. During this time, there was nestled in between three river systems. On the northwest was Sindhu, the Indus River. On the southeast was the Ganga River. In between was the beautiful Yamuna River. 
between these three Himalayan streams, there existed a great kingdom because this was a very fertile region of the earth. Even today, this region of the earth between the Sindhu and the Ganga and of course the Brahmaputra over here, one in 12 of humanity lives in this region. It is so fertile, it's God's own country. In this region, in the waning years of the Dwapara Yuga, there was a great kingdom. To the north of this region was Madra Desha. These were the today's Himachal and Kashmir people. Even more north of that was Gandhara, that is today's Afghanistan. A little bit south was Matsya Desha, which is today's uh, perhaps Chambal Valley. And then on this side was Ayodhya, Kosala, the land of Rama. And beyond that was Magadha, the cradle of Indian civilization. Beyond that was Vanga, Bengal, and Bangladesh. And beyond that was Anga, Assam. And down south was Kalinga, Orissa. And then there was Andhra, the land that we are in right now. And then a little bit more south was Karnata and Kishkinda, the land of Karnataka. And, but among all of these great kingdoms, there was one kingdom that was the greatest. And it was the kingdom of the Kurus. They lived in a city called Hastinapura. Hasti means elephants. This was the city of elephants. Now this city was the greatest of its time and it was ruled by a blind king named Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra had 100 children. He also had five nephews. The 100 children, as you know, are the Kauravas and the five nephews are the Pandavas. Now these were young. Dhritarashtra was probably in his 50s or 60s. Now the real power behind the kingdom was not Dhritarashtra, but it was a man named Bhishma. He was already 80 years old at this time. But nobody dared attack Bhishma. Now let's think about that for a moment. Today, let's say we say India is a powerful country. Do we say nobody dares attack Narendra Modi or Draupadi Mormo? We don't. We say nobody dares attack the Indian army. Right? Same with the United States. Nobody says nobody dares attack President Biden. Of course you can attack President Biden. That's not the point. The point is nobody dares attack the American army. So power today is because you have tanks, you have aircraft carriers, you have nuclear weapons, you have squadrons of Sukhoi airplanes and artillery, armor, cavalry, and etc., etc. That's where you get the power. You get the power by harnessing nature. You, you take the power that God's given us, the muscles and the eyes and the ears, and we use our intellect to harness nature, unlock the chemical power and the nuclear power and the electrical power. But back in Dwapara Yoga, things were different. People harnessed the power of the mind, not the power of nature. It was possible for a warrior to take an arrow, go into deep concentration, take the power of the mind to invoke the elemental nature of Agni, fire and the arrow would glow with heat and as soon as he shot the arrow it would rain down fire on the opposing army and on the opposite side the warrior would do the same thing he would take an arrow concentrate deeply and then invoke the power of water and it was as if a sea would gush from his arrow and extinguish the fire these were weapons of mass destruction back in the day and counter weapons the warrior needed enormous amount of concentration, determination. Can you imagine in the heat of battle suddenly to concentrate and to invoke an elemental power? What does it take? To imagine the extraordinary amount of mental power that one would need. Now Bhishma was such a great yogi, such a great adept that he had that. He had mastered all except one of these magical weapons. They are called mantrastras because you would use the power of your mind and there would be a chant that you would utter. The resonance of the chant would draw the element, whether it is Agni or Vayu or Varuna or whatever, what have you, it doesn't matter. It would draw it in. So these mantrastras, Bhima, Bhishma was very adept at all of those. And he was austere. He had completely sacrificed his life for the happiness of his father and stepmother. And he had taken a vow to be celibate, to never marry and produce children, and he had taken a vow to never ascend the throne. But even at 80 years of old, this austere, self-sacrificing warrior struck 
terror into the hearts of his enemies. That's why nobody dared attack Bhishma. Not Bhishma's army, it didn't matter. The man himself, nobody dared attack him. But he was getting old, he's already 80. Dhritarashtra was not that effective as a king. So Bhishma knew that he had to pick among his 105 grand nephews, he had to pick somebody as a worthy successor. Well, how do you determine who's the successor? You have to educate them, of course, and you have to see who does best during education. So he needed a guru for all of them. Now one day, these 105 boys, they were playing out, out in the field. And they were playing this game, which perhaps many of you play even now. You take a big stick and there is a small stick and you hit the small stick with the big stick, it rises up and then you hit. Anybody played that game? Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> Yeah, Viti Danda. So they were, it was played in Mahabharata times as well. So they played that game and then the small stick, the Viti went and fell into a deep well. Now we have to remember these boys were just 8 to 12 years old. They were just young boys. They, they, you know, they still would cry because that's, they, they're between babies and men. That was kind of their age. So they, they all rush to this well. They, their game is interrupted. It's a very deep well. It's about 60 feet deep. They don't know what to do. Some people are just restlessly pacing around. Other boys are beginning to cry. You know, their lips are quivering. Um, and they're standing there. And suddenly, behind them, they hear a voice. It's a very deep voice. And it's mocking. It says, shame on you. Are you the princess of the great Bharata dynasty? Shame on you. You cannot even... Take a stick from a well. How are you going to rule the most prosperous kingdom in the world? Then they turn around all these boys, first in surprise and then also in indignation. Who, they were the princes who dare speak to them that way. And standing in front of them, a very tall man, very thin, he had flowing white hair and he had a flowing white beard and he had a white dhoti tied around his thin waist and he had an angavastram a top cloth of pure white. And he was completely unadorned except for a ring made of white gold. And there was a white tilak going from here all the way up to his white matted hair as if it merged and became one. It was as if a lock of hair had just fallen down on his forehead. And his eyes were blazing with an ethereal kind of strength. Then they look at him, they start back. And then Duryodhana, who is already prideful for his age, he says, are you blind? Do you not see that it's a stick fallen in a well? What does that have to do with warriors? I can go kill anybody you want. I just don't know how to get a stick. Which is true, he has a good point. And then this man, he says, shame on you. A real warrior would know exactly what to do. And then Duryodhana says, well, do you know what to do? Are you a real warrior? And this man says, yes, I am. What are you willing to give me if I bring that back? He says, you promise you're not going to use anything else? He says, absolutely not. What are you going to give me? And Duryodhana, he's a boy. He says, well, I'm going to give you lunch. I say, OK, fine. It, it's been since yesterday. I only eat once a day. So I'm about ready for lunch. And then Duryodhana mocks him. He says, throw your ring into the well and retrieve both the piece of wood and um, and the ring. And this man says yes. And then he bends down and picks up a, a clump of grass. Okay? Um, and there are two types of grasses in India, if you go around. The most common grass that, that grows around everywhere is called the Isha grass. The less common is called the kusha grass. Kusha grass, when you dry it, is what's used as a darbha. That's the one that you use for all kinds of religious ceremonies or you sit on it for meditation. Isha grass is what you find there. So, so even among grasses, it was very ordinary grass. So this man picks up the grass. And then he does something interesting. He stands tall. Suddenly, it seems as if he becomes taller. There's a vibration that goes through his body. He brings this clump of ordinary grass right up here, then his lips move in some silent chant and the air around him vibrates just a little bit. It's a slight disturbance. 
and then the grass suddenly becomes like steel spikes. Each one of them, they transform right there in front of his eyes. And then he takes one blade of this grass, which is now a steel spike, and then throws it. So accurate is his aim that it falls. So accurate is his aim that it falls right in the center of the viti. And then with blinding speed, he throws one after the other. And then each one goes and stick to the top of the previous one. And pretty soon there is a unbreakable steel chain made out. All of this happens in approximately one second. From here all the way to the steel chain in one second. And then he calls Yudhishthira. He says, bring up your danda. And bring up your viti. And then as Yudhishthira pulls, he goes to Duryodhana, who has a bow. He's a prince. He takes his bow. Then takes an arrow and then shoots it with such extraordinary skill that the arrow goes down. It's going in a curving trajectory. It goes down like this. The curve is so perfectly defined that it, on its own, just based on trajectory, it begins to come up. But it hooks the ring right in the tip of the arrow. And within another half a second, before they knew what was happening, the arrow comes and lands exactly at his feet. He bends down calmly picks up the ring and puts it on and says, now where is my lunch? Take me to Bhishma. And the boys run to Bhishma and uh, they, they all come around him, they hold his legs and, and Bhishma says, okay, okay, settle down everybody, what's going on? Why are you so excited? And he says, they tell them what happened. And Bhishma is now very happy, he says, praise be to the gods, the great Drona, Dronacharya is now here. You see, this man, this Brahmin, was none other than the famous Dronacharya who was schooled in martial arts by the great Parushurama himself. And he knows all the mantras, trust, the secret of all of them. But Dronacharya was after money. I don't have time to tell you the reasons, but he just wanted money. So he didn't teach anybody until he found the proper patron. And so Bhishma invites Dronacharya. He says, will you please teach the princes of the great kingdom of Kuru, will you please teach them all the martial arts? And Dronacharya says, yes, Bhishma. Bhishma, of course, is famous and it's a privilege to teach them. And then he looks at Bhishma and Bhishma understands. He says, I'm going to give you a large piece of land and I'm going to build you a palace there. And I'm going to give you so many horses, so many chariots, this much of gold. He gives them a large piece of land. And that piece of land is what we today know, know as Guru Gram or Gurgaon. It's outside of Delhi. So the next time you go there, know that you're in the presence of history. Okay? The Delhi itself, by the way, is Indraprastha. I, I don't, it's a different part of Mahabharata. So thus begins the training of the Pandavas. And remember, Arjuna is one of the Pandavas. He's right there. The first day of training. Now you have to pay close attention because I'm talking about the laws of success. On the first day of training, Dronacharya goes. There are 105 princes sitting like you are. And except they're boys, they're very restless. They're jumping around and Dronacharya tells them. He says, I'm going to make you all warriors. If you work hard enough, because this is not a university. You see, back in the day, these things were done in a place called a Gurukula. Gurukula means the clan of the teacher. A Gurukula was in an ashram. It's, it was outside the city so that the students wouldn't have all the comforts of home. They needed discipline. Somebody said discipline, you needed to be successful. So they wouldn't have the comforts of home. And Drona established a Gurukula. Oh, the Gurukula system is customized education. The way it worked was that the teacher, the, the curriculum was not set. The teacher would look at you evaluate you and say, okay, for you, I'm going to teach you sword fighting. For you, I'm going to teach you charioteering. For you, I'm going to teach you how to wield spears. And then he would insert tests here and there. He wouldn't tell that those are tests, but he'd watch. And if you did well, then he'd teach you more. If you didn't, he wouldn't. In other words, education was not based on prerequisites, meaning it wasn't based on what you already knew. It was based on how much you were willing to work. OK? 
Okay, everybody with me? So this was a Gurukula system. You, you still have those in India. And um, So in this Gurukula, Drona comes the first day. He talks to the 105 princes and he says, what I'm about to teach you is free. I'm not allowed to charge anything. I don't want to charge anything. You know why? Because I didn't invent this. I was taught by my guru for free, who was taught by his guru for free, and therefore I will teach you for free. And this was open to everybody. Anybody could come, not just the Pandavas and the Kauravas. And he said, once you learn from me, there has to be energy exchange. It has to be transactional. But I won't ask you for anything. If, based on your heart, you wish to give me a gift, I will gratefully accept it. This is called Guru Dakshina, a gift given to the teacher. This is given at graduation. But he says, I have a request. However, there is something in my mind. I have something that I desire. I want one of you to give it to me. Who will give it? Remember, the Guru tests you every now and then. Everybody is thinking, now what? Should I say yes? What if he says, at the end of everything, I want you to cut off your hands? That doesn't feel right. What if he says, I want you to give up everything, never marry, and go off to uh, the forest? After all, my grandfather did the same thing. This doesn't feel right. They're all thinking. But then, there's a voice from among them. He gets up and says, Guru Deva, I will do whatever you ask me to. This is the voice of Arjuna. He doesn't know what Drona wants. He doesn't know what he has to give, but it doesn't matter. He said, I'm going to give you whatever you want. Dronacharya is very happy. He says, I have found my star student. He doesn't say anything. But why did he find a star student? Because when you are in school, whether it's university or gurukula or continued education, doesn't matter. Even if you're watching a YouTube video, the willingness to learn is the most important thing. How can you learn? If you don't have complete trust in the teacher, that's teaching it. So saying yes to the teacher is the most important criterion. So Arjuna passes the first test. Drona decides right then and there that I'm going to make him the greatest warrior. And then their education begins. Now Drona has a son named Ashwatthama. He wants to teach his son some special tricks and techniques that he doesn't want to teach anybody else. Naturally, he's the father. So what he does, but he cannot say that because people won't like it, it's not fair. So what he does is, he says, every morning, each of you will go and fill this big pot with water from the Yamuna River. And he gives them each a very big pot, like it's this big, it's a very narrow mouth. Now, have you tried filling a big pot with a narrow mouth in the river? Anybody? I'm guessing not. Okay? But I've tried it for some reason, and it's not easy. It takes forever. Because it's a narrow mouth, you start to fill it, it becomes heavy, then it falls down, then you have to redo it again. So it'll take about 10 to 15 minutes. He gave Ashwatthama a pot with a very wide mouth. So Ashwatthama went, scooped it up, and ran up. So in the 15 minutes, he, Dronacharya would teach Ashwatthama some special things. This went on, and the, initially you begin by teaching the basic things, and the basic things that Dronacharya taught everybody was a way to control water and fire. Just basic mantras. And then they're going and Duryodhana is complaining, oh, how come Ashwatthama gets new things? Arjuna doesn't complain. One day he says, hmm, what should I do? So when everybody runs to the river to fill their water pot, Arjuna just sits down right next to Drona. And says, Drona says, Arjuna, what are you doing? Shh, Gurudeva, I'm trying something. He sits down, recalls the mantra that controls water, concentrates deeply, and suddenly the pot is filled with water. And he says, Guru Deva, I'm done. And Ashwatthama is still coming back. Now Drona has no choice but to teach Arjuna these special skills as well. There's no choice. He was caught in his own game. Inwardly, Drona smiles. Says, Good, well done, he says. And then, now each of these people specialize in their own special skills. Yudhishthira becomes the greatest charioteer. Bhima and Duryodhana become very, very good with the mace. Arjuna becomes a great archer, Nakula becomes a great horseman, Sahadeva becomes a great wielder of spear, each one. But now the time has come to teach these mantrastras, these great astral weapons. But Drona needs to test people. So he's, he doesn't do anything, he just kind of lies there. And then one day he says, uh, the, the caretaker of the ashram, he says, 
today extinguish the light during dinner time. So he does that. And everybody is eating. Arjuna is eating too. And then everybody continues to eat. Have you ever had a power cut and you were eating? Didn't you continue to eat? I hope you did. There's no reason to stop eating just because it's dark. Why is that? Because we know exactly how to eat. Now you and I have done that, but Arjuna says, hmm, how is it that my hand knows where to find the mouth even though it's pitch dark? Right? It's not like dark in Hyderabad where there's some light here or there. In, in, a, in a forest, it's pitch dark. And how is it? Then he begins to think. Next day he thinks about it some more. And then third day, he says, you know, maybe I can shoot arrows even though I cannot see. He has that thought. So next day at midnight when everybody is asleep, remember they've had an entire day of training, everybody is tired. Arjuna slowly gets up and Dronacharya is sleeping on the bed, everybody else is sleeping on the floor. Gets up slowly, he goes, and without making any sound, carefully touches Dronacharya's feet, seeking his blessing, and then walks away. Drona is awake. He's just kind of smiling. Uh, he just does a little snore just for effect. Then Arjuna goes away into the forest. And then he begins to practice. He tries to, he bears a forest owl and then he tries to shoot an arrow. Doesn't work. Next day it doesn't work. He practices until 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Then keeps going. Every day at exactly midnight Arjuna gets up, touches Drona's feet, goes off into the forest and then practices this. And this goes on for a long time, a week, a month. And then one day, right around 3 a.m., Drona hears the sound of an owl screeching and crashing into the forest floor. Then he's ecstatic. He gets up, runs to Arjuna, and then he says, my son, nothing stands in between you and becoming the greatest of all warriors. This was the test that I designed when the light went off during your meal, because I wanted you to know that as an archer, you don't have to have your eyes. You can shoot through sound itself. This is called Shabda Vedhi. Vedhi is piercing, Shabda is sound, Shabda Vedhi. And Arjuna becomes the only warrior in the entire world who has mastered this skill all by himself. Talk about willpower, determination, initiative, discipline, creativity. How many things can you label it? All the things that you guys said. And then he says, now I'm ready to teach you all the mantrastras. So he teaches him Agniyastra, the power of Agni, the fire. Varunastra, the counter weapon, the power of water. Aindrastra, the power of storms. Vayuvyastra, the power of wind, which can scatter the storm. Sarpastra, the poison of all snakes in the entire world. And Garudastra, the the of this. He's just a nephew. He's not even in line for the throne. You should be teaching me all of this. And Dronacharya looks at him and says, Duryodhana, if I taught you, do you have the ability to receive it? And Duryodhana says, yes. Test me however you want. Dronacharya says, fine. Let me make a test. And then they go into the forest. There is a big tree there. And in that tree is, the, is a wooden bird. And he says, the objective is very far away. And it's a tree with a lot of uh, leaves. You know, it's one of those Ashwatha trees, the, the people tree. You know how many leaves the people tree has? Have you all seen it? So, um, in that people tree, and it's windy, the, the leaves are waving, and the, the eye of the bird goes in and out. And he says, I want you to shoot that bird with your arrow. It's a wooden bird. And then he calls Yudhishthira, the eldest of the Pandavas. Then Yudhishthira takes his bow, takes great aim, he's standing there, his hands are slightly shaking because he's very nervous. And it's like your exam. And Drona says, Yudhishthira, stop. Okay, he stops. What do you see? And Yudhishthira says, Guru Deva, I see you. you. See me, really? I'm standing over here. Yes, sir, I have good, excellent peripheral vision, 20 20. He says, okay, good. What else do you see? Oh, I see the beautiful clouds. I see, I see the wind moving the lotus uh, bush over there and say, okay, okay, good, what else do you see? And he says, I see all the leaves. How many are there? Oh, thousands. Are they beautiful? Absolutely, they're beautiful. Do you see the bird? Yes, I kind of see it. And then Drona says, you can shoot the arrow, but you'll fail. Yudhishthira shoots the arrow, it goes wild. Doesn't even hit the tree, goes someplace else. And he calls Duryodhana. Same question, Duryodhana.
recognized him. He's a very powerful man, Duryodhana. So his muscles are rippling as he stands there. He's a very proud man. So his chin is lifted. He's standing there like that. And he says, Duryodhana, what do you see? Now Duryodhana is calculating. He said, something's wrong with what Yudhishthira said. Uh, and, and he said, what should I say? But he doesn't know. So he panics and says, sir, I see everything. He said, really, you see everything? Okay, good for you. Uh, do you see the bird? He says, I totally see the bird. Uh, what do you see of the bird? He says, oh, he describes the bird. He's making it all up. And then Duryodhana says, fine, shoot the arrow. You won't hit it. And then Duryodhana shoots the arrow. Goes wild. Calls Bhima. Bhima, Bhima is a pa powerful man, strength of 10,000 elephants. He has no trouble drawing the bow. He's standing there. He himself is like a tree. It's as if nothing, uh, it's not at all an effort. He says, Bhima, what do you see? Bhima says, do you see me? He says, no, sir, I don't see you. Uh, and then says, do you see the tree? Yeah, I see the tree. And Bhima always says whatever's in his mind. He's a very straightforward kind of fellow. And then says, do you see the bird? No, I don't see the bird. I don't know why you've designed this stupid test because if you want me to shoot the bird, I gotta be able to see the bird. And he says, okay, well, shoot the arrow. Nothing's going to happen. Does it. Now Duryodhana, Yudhishthira, Bhima, all the princes, they're all standing there and calls Arjuna, Arjuna, come. Then Arjuna has his strong, supple body, his blue, dark, indigo-colored skin, and he's not over-muscled, but he's perfectly muscled. And he stands there, the very picture of grace and power, and he pulls the arrow so easily, and nothing's moving, and his eyes are like laser beams. And Drona says, Arjuna, do you see the tree? He says, no, sir. Do you see the leaves? No, sir. Do you see the bird? No, sir. Then what do you see? I see the eye of the bird. Do you see anything else? No, sir. Even as he says it, nothing moves because he's so concentrated. And then he, Drona looks at everybody. He says, I can tell you right now, Arjuna can bring down the target. He doesn't need to do anything. But just to prove it to you, he says, my son, shoot the arrow. And the arrow flies right into the center of the eye of the bird. And then he looks at everybody and he says, now do you know why I ta taught Arjuna everything? If you can do that, if you can muster this extraordinary power of concentration, I will teach you this too. Can anybody do that? Everybody bows their head, heads and leave. This way now Arjuna is rapidly becoming as great a warrior as Bhishma or even Drona himself. There is only one thing remaining to be taught. Drona has to teach him a great weapon. It is called Brahmashiras. Brahmashiras means the Shiras, the head of Brahma. Brahma is the creator, meaning this is not a weapon that accesses fire, water, wind, storm, poison, ocean, mountains, none. It doesn't even access the mind. What is more powerful than that? The creative power of God itself, the creative potential of the universe can be accessed through Brahma Shiras. Can you imagine the power? But not everybody can wield this weapon. So Dronacharya doesn't know, can Arjuna do this? So one day, he goes into the river. There is an area in the river where it is known that a great crocodile lives. Nobody goes there. But all the other students are there as well. You know, they are filling their water pot. They are doing whatever they are doing. And Drona goes into the river and casually swims towards the area where the crocodile is. And suddenly there is a disturbance in the water and then the giant crocodile comes and latches onto Drona's uh, calf muscle. And Drona is screaming. He says, somebody please save me. He could with his mental power simply incinerate the crocodile right there, but he doesn't do that. Somebody please save me. And then Duryodhana is panicking. He runs up, he says, help, help. Yudhishthira doesn't know what to do. They are all frozen. And some people are crying. They just, everybody is frozen. But within an instant, Arjuna, who is completely unmoved by all of these, in lightning speed, he draws one, two, three, four, five arrows and shoots them with such extraordinary precision. You have to visualize the crocodiles clamping its great big teeth into Drona's calf muscle, having drawn blood. He shoots the arrow in between the teeth and the calf muscle, one after the other, and goes right into the crocodile's tiny little brain and kills it. It is all over in an instant where all the others are panicking. And then Drona comes out unscathed. There's not even a scratch on his body because of the arrow except the gash from the crocodile's teeth. 
And Arjuna come, uh, Drona comes up and says, my son Arjuna, you have demonstrated the greatest quality of a warrior. Everybody is listening. What is the greatest quality of a warrior? They don't know. And Drona says, you have demonstrated the ability to remain calm under this situation where all the rest of you panicked. You didn't know what to do if this were a real war and you had Brahmashiras, the creative power of the universe, a weapon of mass destruction, what would you do? You would destroy the universe, that's why none of you deserve it. Arjuna alone deserves it because he has the greatest skill that is necessary for success. In a moment of crisis, in a moment, Arjuna loves me like his own father. He has seen me about to die, but in that extraordinary moment of crisis, his mind was as calm as a tree on a windless day. And therefore, he was able to make the right decision. Without calmness, Gambhiriya it is called. That's what Rama had. They always call him Gambhira Rama. It's because it's that calmness that's what made him a great warrior. Krishna had that and now Arjuna has it. So he says, come Arjuna, sit. I'm going to give you the weapon called Brahmashiras that nobody except Rama, Krishna, Parashurama and myself in all of creation. Only the four of us know. Not even Bhishma knows this. Oh, now I will give it to you. And how, how are these things given? He says, Arjuna, sit in Padmasan. Arjuna sits in perfect Padmasan, closes his eyes, and Drona sits next to him. And then they both draw their consciousness inward. They begin to meditate. They go off. They forget their body. And their mind and heart is completely open for it, the transmission of this great astral resonance of a mantra. And Drona leans, whispers in Arjuna's right ear, the great mantra of Brahmashiras. And Arjuna feels the love of his guru first and foremost. And it's through the medium of love. Love is the carrier wave of this particular piece of wisdom. He feels the love of, that's why it's called Guru Kripa the love of his guru, he feels that and from that he begins to feel the resonance of the Brahmashiras, the creative power of Om, his entire body resonates with it and he knows in that moment that this is here to stay for as long as he lives the love of his guru is with him and for as long as he lives the power of Brahmashiras is with Arjuna and so it was that after this Drona says, Arjuna, my son, remember, Brahmashiras should never be used against anybody that is a human being. It's not meant to be used against human beings. If it is a daitya, a rakshasa, a yaksha, use it against them. But if you use it again, if you lose your cool, if you're not calm under pressure and you give in to anger and use it against any human being, doesn't matter the entire universe will burn. That is why I had to subject you through this test because the greatest criterion for success is calmness. And then Arjuna says, yes, Gurudeva, I will promise you that I won't do this. And having said that, Drona releases Arjuna from his meditation. And this was how Arjuna became the greatest warrior of his age, comparable to Rama, and Krishna. You all know what happens later in the Mahabharata. At the end of Mahabharata, 18 great battalions have fought and died. You know how many people live? Eight people live. That's it. And you know how many people are undefeated in that one among these eight people? Just one, Arjuna, no one else. How's that for success? Isn't that the definition of success? So now what can we learn from this story? I'll go through these very quickly. First one, first criterion for success is we have to say yes to life. 
no matter what happens, sometimes the greatest tragedy might really be a blessing in disguise. If you are asked at workplace to do something that you really hate, consider saying yes and see what happens. You never know. I used to be very scared of public speaking when I was younger. And the very first job I got, after having done my master's in computer science, the very first job I got was to do phone support. Okay? And in that, they trained me how to speak. And once I learned how to speak, I began to enjoy it. I wouldn't have known what it would be to speak publicly if I hadn't said yes to that one. And I'm sure you all have things like that in your own life. Remember, that's the first criterion. You have to say yes to life and then figure out how to do this. Say yes first and then figure out how you're going to do it. The second one, and this is very important, is there is a, it's a beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita. It says, Yadrucha labha santu, yadrucha labha santosho dvandvatito vimatsaraha. Yadrucha labha means whatever you get, wherever you are right this moment. You know, some, of, uh, some people are in a good place, some people are in a bad place. It doesn't matter. Yadrucha labha is whatever comes, wherever you are right now. Santushto. Santushto means be happy with it because it is the best thing. There cannot be any doubt. After all, it's all being run as a result of karma and God's grace. How can it be bad? Yadruchalaba santushto dvandvatito. Don't feel this way or that way about it. That's only going to sap your energy. Vimatsaraha. Don't feel jealous. Irshya. It's called matsara. Irshya. They are both the same. Irshya is a word in Telugu as well. It's all the same. It says, when you do that, then you have the ability to be successful in life. Yadruchalabo santushto dvandvatito vimatsaraha. Acceptance is the greatest quality of success. That's what Arjuna did. Everybody got a water pot and Ashwatthama got a bigger one. Arjuna didn't question, he accepted it. The moment you accept it, you unlock the power to change the situation. Until you accept it, you don't have the power to unlock it. Door is being shut. So acceptance is the second very important criterion. Okay, everybody with me on this? There are great things to learn from the Mahabharata. That's why stories are told this way. Then what is the third one? Willpower. Now, Shabdavedi, Arjuna got up every day at midnight. You have to, this is a boot camp. There's, they make them do a lot of work from six in the morning, filling the water pot, all day swordsmanship, charioteering, this and that, and then a very small meal, then you have to sleep on the floor. 12 o'clock, this boy gets up, bows to his guru, goes off, does that day after day, week after week, month after month, not even knowing whether this can be done. There's no textbook on this, there's no Wikipedia article that you can look up, YouTube video, nothing. Cannot even ask his guru on this one. How's that for indomitable willpower? Okay, in um, In chapter 18 of the Gita, when Krishna is summarizing everything, he says, Dhrutya avyayabhi charinya yogena yaya dharayate manaha pranendriya kriyaha. Dhrushya avyayabhi charinya yogena yaya dharayate manaha pranendriya kriyaha. Dhrutya, dhriti, means willpower. He says, how to develop willpower? Dhritya. Vyayabhicharanya, meaning becomes, it comes to you. Vyayabhicharanya. By doing what? Yogena yaya, by the practices of yoga. To do what? Manaha pranendriya kriyaha. Dharayate. Dharayate means control. Okay, somebody was talking about dharana earlier. I heard that. That's what dharana means. It means control of what? What do you, what do we, what should we control in order to be successful? Manaha. Mind, pranendriya kriyaha. Prana means energy, indriya means senses. The energy flowing through the senses, kriyaha, actions. The actions that result from the energy flowing through the senses, in other words, discipline. Through yoga, control your mind and discipline your senses. That's how you develop willpower. 
Shabdavedi, think about Arjuna, because that's what makes him eligible for all the mantrastras. So how do you do that? Yogananda used to say that in order to do that, you have to do it gradually. You have to pick something that is very difficult for you. So very small thing. It doesn't have to be a big thing. Maybe, here's an example, maybe you want to get up in the morning and drink a cup of coffee. Okay, perhaps many of us do that here. Okay. How about get up in the morning, wait for four hours, and drink a cup of coffee? <laughs> well, you got to do that. Right? It, it's a small thing. That, that develops willpower. It, it's pretty extraordinary how that works. Do something that you're not used to doing, just a small thing, and you'll suddenly see how much more empowered you become in life. You know, old age is often defined as, in the, in the yogic, in Vedanta, old age is defined as that time of life when you have reduced choices. See, when you're younger, the entire world is open to you. When you're older, your choices are very limited. But most people get old even when they are young because they are drawn to these habits and lack the willpower to change it. Okay, literally, the way to get young is to do these little, little things. So Yogananda writes about this in this beautiful book called um, The Secrets of Success. Uh, we don't have a copy of it, but we will at some point. But remember this, um, dhritya avyaya bhicharinya yogena yaya dharayate manaha pranendriya kriyaha, controlling the senses. It, it all takes these little, little things. How about doing something with love, and interest. If all you're doing is drinking coffee, drink coffee with interest tomorrow and see what happens. You, you, will, you will taste coffee in a different way. I remember once, the first time I meditated many years ago, I was sitting in a room and at the end of meditation I looked out and my mind was so focused that I saw the trees. I, I live in Seattle which is known for being green and I saw 50, 60 shades of green right there, because my mind was focused. My heart was interested. That's the beauty of willpower. Shabdavedi, that's what Arjuna was able to bring, willpower. Saying yes to life, acceptance, willpower. Then the mind is capable of anything, solving any problem. This is absolutely true, as long as we are able to concentrate. Somebody said concentration, and I went through the initial thing, right? In fact, it's so important that in yoga, there are three words given to concentration, not one. Anybody know what that is? What those three are? Dharana, dhyana, samadhi. All these three mean concentration. It's so important. So learning to concentrate is an extremely important skill to develop. Okay, that's why Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, he says, I'm going to now tell you the secret. Asyate bihita sankhe buddhir yogi tvamam I have told you all philosophy. I'm going to tell you... Um, yoga now, and he says, neha bhikramana shosti pratyavayo na vidyate svalpamatyasya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat. This yoga is so powerful that even a little bit of practice is going to free you from dire fears and colossal sufferings. And then he says, the key to success, vyavasayatmika buddhireke ha kurunandana bahushaka hyanam tascha buddhayo avyavasayinam. Once you come into this path of yoga, the path of success, you have to have a one-pointed concentration on what you're doing bahu shakha hyanam tascha buddhayo avyavasayinam. Shakha means branches. There are too many branches of thought for somebody that's not committed. So concentration is very important. Saying yes to life, acceptance, willpower, concentration. But the problem is we can all recall situations where we've done that. Who among us haven't done one of these? But why are we not able to endure? That's why you need calmness. So Krishna says, Sukhe dukhe samekritva labha labha jaya jaya tato yudhaya yudjitsva naivam papam avapsyasi. Sukha dukha labha alabha. Sorrow, happiness, profit, loss. Samekritva, make them all the same. Don't react to it. Be calm. Tato yudhaya yudjitsva. Life is a battle. Yudhaya yudjitsva. Fight the battle of life. Na evam, na, na evam papam avapsyasi. You will not incur any sin, meaning you will be able to be successful. So this 
You know why calmness is so important? Now I'm going to conclude my talk with this one. You, have, you bring great willpower into something. But your emotions are disturbed, like I said in the beginning. Can you sustain that willpower? Has this happened to you? You're doing something and then suddenly, usually it's your loved ones that can push your buttons, you know, your spouse, your parent. They say something like, oh, I cannot believe you said that. And then just to punish them, you stop doing it. Has that happened to you? Maybe not. It certainly happened to me. But what's happened there just goes away. But that's emotional poise, lack of calmness. There is no gambhira anymore. There's no gambhira in us. You're trying to concentrate, suddenly you're restless. You know, it's like, oh, I wish I had a better chair. I want to go adjust the AC somehow, uh, something like that. Physical restlessness destroys your concentration. Mental restlessness, oh, let me go watch this thing on Netflix, or whatever. Uh, it happens, destroys you, oh, let me get a cup of coffee. These things destroy the, uh, the um, concentration. So even if you did all of these without the ability to stay calm, you just cannot sustain this. Okay, everybody with me? Does this make sense? That's why, remember, yoga staha kuru karmani sangam tyaktva dhananjaya siddha siddhyo samobhutva samatvam yoga vuchyate. The wise say that the ability to stay calm is itself the definition of yoga, i.e. it is the definition of success. Okay? Now, one final thought before I finish today is how do you stay calm? How do you stay calm? Yeah. The, you see, calmness is not something that you can do through willpower. You can a little bit, but it's near impossible. Everybody agree with me? Okay, the, the mind is impossible to control. But then, our nature is calmness. It's called sthita pragya. The nature of the soul, when we, are, when we are very close to, when our heart is filled with love, when selfishness leaves us, you know what we become? We become calm. We must have all experienced those moment, moments of great love or when we've done something great or we are in the presence of a great shrine in a temple. We become calm. That's our nature. We don't have to develop calmness. It's already who we are. We have to remove restlessness. This, you're shifting the equation. Okay? You, you, developing calmness, why would you develop something that you already are? But you have to remove restlessness. And the way to remove restlessness is through meditation, is through hatha yoga is Yogananda taught a system of uh, exercises called energization exercises. It's just tensing and relaxing the body. It's, it is through chanting, it is through japa. So I could do the Gayatri japa for example. Om Guru, Sri Ram, Jai Ram, any of those. Uh, any japa will do that. All of these taken together is called Raja Yoga, the path of meditation. And it's not that hard.